welcome to the official YouTube channel of Anastasis Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ananya B. Chatterjee, your VRC faculty. So guys, uh, as you know, in this series, we take up one article from somewhere on the internet and we discuss the meaning, the vocabulary, the flow of ideas, the main idea, the tone and the style. And we try to touch base with as many various different distinct topics as possible. So uh, today's topic in Bibliophile that we are going to cover is history of paganism. Now, what is paganism? What, how did it originate and how do we know it today? That's all we are going to talk about. Why do we do this? Because CAT is primarily reading based. And because CAT is reading based, we have questions like reading comprehension. We have questions like para summary, para jumble, so on and so forth, you know. So, yeah. All right, history of paganism. Let's start. Okay. Paganism. Often referred to as neo-paganism. Uh, neo means new. Neoclassicism, neo-impressionism, right? Constitutes a diverse array of religious beliefs and practices that have emerged from indigenous cultures and ancient traditions worldwide. So this is a... collection of beliefs and practices that have emerged from indigenous cultures. So what do you mean by indigenous? Indigenous means local or native. As we know, world is a huge place. Our planet Earth is a huge place. And we have so many different cultures and we have so many different uh, belief systems in this world. Uh, belonging to different regions and so on and so forth. So from ancient traditions and cultures and ancient traditions worldwide. So it's a sum total of everything that can be considered, uh, you know, indigenous belief or indigenous practices. The term pagan originates from the Latin word paganus, signifying country dweller or rustic. What do you mean by rustic? Not civilized or not sophisticated. So paganus means a country dweller. In Hindi we say na gaon wala hai. Like that. Or rustic. Not very sophisticated. That's how they named it. And was initially employed by early Christians to denote those who adhere to traditional beliefs outside Christianity. So this is the origin story. Initially employed, who coined this term? The Christians, the early Christians. And for whom was this coin, uh, term coined? Those who adhere to traditional beliefs outside of Christianity, basically, who had their own way of doing worship, who had their own gods, and they did not believe in the whole concept of one God, and that God is Jesus, so on and so forth. Oh, Jesus is the God's son, though. But anyway, the rich history, where are we? The rich history of paganism traces its roots back to various cultures and ancient traditions. Ancient as in pre-Christianity kind of ancient, right? Making it a fascinating tapestry. Tapestry is basically on the curtains and all. So the author is using uh, imagery here. So the author is um, Comparing the spiritual exploration across time and geography as the tapestry in a house, like how a, how a house is decorated, you know, and uh, it is a fascinating tapestry of spiritual exploration across time and geography. The history of paganism can be traced back to prehistoric times when humans first began to observe and worship natural phenomena such as the sun, moon, stars. 
so humans in the early days of civilization started acknowledging the power of these entities you know how the movement of sun changes the time for us or how moon you know is a regular feature or they could see the stars also much clearly than we can today i'm sure but they could see the stars also so the belief in an animism the idea that all things both living and non living uh, possess a spiritual essence was a central aspect of early pagan belief so what do you mean by animism let us focus on this word a little you know i heard a similar concept in uh, the maori tribe of new zealand they were the indigenous tribe of new zealand before it was colonized by european forces they believe in the concept of mana they call it mana in their maori language mana according to them to the best of my understanding forgive me if i'm going a little um, if i am assuming a little but according to my understanding mana means the essence of anything and everything under the sun which is a part of the creation you know the life force the sense of dignity even in a tree even in a mountain even in the river so animism is a lot like that that just because you think that a certain entity is lifeless it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a universal spiritual essence it still has it it might not be living based on your definition right but these things have essence powerful spiritual essence and that was the central aspect of early pagan beliefs you know this thing the idea that all things both living and non living according to us possess a spiritual essence this was the central idea behind the pagan beliefs as civilizations developed different pagan traditions emerged so a belief system so you understand it this way first you have observation right then you have a belief system on that observation then that belief system gives rise to traditions and rituals in any civilization rituals and those become perpetuated across time with slight difference here and there pretty much right so as civilizations developed different pagan traditions emerged incorporating local customs and cultural influences so pagan paganism is also known as nature worshiping Hmm. paganism flourished in various forms throughout history in ancient greece the polytheistic religion polytheistic means what so here is a good idea theism means belief in god it's a now belief in god polytheism is faith in multiple gods not a singular entity for example hindu sanatana dharma is a polytheistic religion you have krishna you have G ganesha you have uh, goddesses you have shiva you have vishnu like polytheistic religion sanatan is so okay in ancient greece the polytheistic religion revolved around the worship of gods like zeus athena and apollo zeus athena and apollo so greek mythology has been the corners to greek and roman mythology have they have been the cornerstone of a lot of belief system across europe and elsewhere also so so clearly we can see here that um, 
the goddess and gods like Zeus and Athena and Apollo. Zeus was the god of sky and thunder in uh, Greek mythology. And Athena was the goddess. She was one of the 12 chief deities, deities you know. She was the goddess of war and uh, she was the goddess of, I think, uh, retribution maybe. Uh, Apollo was uh, responsible for multiple things, apparently. Apollo dealt with healing also. He dealt with art and craft also, a lot of things, right? So these were the Greek gods, polytheistic, like multiple gods you can see. And these are, these are just three of them. There are many, many more uh, Greek gods, according to mythology. Uh, the Romans had their own pantheon of deities. So what do you mean by the word pantheon? Uh, pantheon is a word which means a group of God-like people, basically, gods. But we can use it like this also, pantheon of uh, legendary authors in English literature, we can say that, because they are, they are God-like, you can say that. Pantheon of greatest physicists in the world, Newton, you know, and uh, Einstein. Yeah. The Romans had their own pantheon, so that was the Greek part. The Romans had their own pantheon of deities, such as Jupiter, Venus, and Mars, right? Many of the practices and beliefs of these ancient pagan religions have left a lasting impact on Western culture, influencing art, literature, and philosophy. So because of these gods and goddesses in ancient Greek and Roman mythology, the ripple effect can be felt in multiple fields even today. The overall culture in the West, the art that is practiced, the literature that has been written and the philosophy which has made its mark in the past, let's say, 2000 years. With the spread of Christianity as the dominant religion in Europe and other parts of the world, paganism faced persecution and suppression. Right? So, understand this. I mean, I'm sure you will be able to understand this so when the patriarchal so 1500 years ago kind of 14 1500 years ago so when a, an organized religion is given so much importance then the nature worshippers become fringe elements na? Those people practicing their ancient uh, indigenous traditions and rituals and uh, belief systems were persecuted and suppressed. Persecuted is when you are treated in a very, let's say, very hostile manner or you are uh, treated in a very unfriendly manner or you are just ill-treated, right? And you're suppressed because you don't conform to the growing notions of uh, Christianity of that era. So they were persecuted and suppressed. Pagan temples and sacred sites were often destroyed just to make their lives very difficult. That you know, We would not let your temples survive. We would not let your sacred sites exist so that they can draw more people. They were destroyed. The pagan rituals were condemned as hearsay. Great. So this condemnation so if, if let us say somebody, if there is a person who, who belongs to an organized religion and is looking at a pagan and say, ha, ha, this person is just superstitious and doesn't know what God is and I don't know what he's doing. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. So there's this sense of condescension. There is this sense of uh, uh, complacence, so sense of superiority that was practiced against the pagan uh, you know, pagan worshippers or nature worshippers. However, pagan beliefs and practices persisted, often blending with Christian traditions in the process. So a long time ago, I heard something which was which left a mark on my mind that, you know, powerful forces, when they try to uproot something which has been there for a very long time, and it's difficult to take away from the culture. Powerful political or religious forces, what they do is, if you can't fight it, co-opt it. Call it yours. 
Great. Um, a similar example you can find in India also. Although I am not saying that this is factually correct or it is supported by the Archaeological Survey of India or anything, but going theoretically, a lot of people say that the Aryan invasion ensured that a lot of people in the Indus Valley civilization are mo they move towards the south. And uh, so if you look at the other gods like Vishnu ji and uh, Brahma ji and so on and so forth. So these powerful uh, gods in Hindu mythology, they're all so fair skinned and they're all, you know, sitting on lotuses and they're all clean and wearing jewelry. And that's how they have been depicted. Kanana Kundal and all that. You know, but when you look at Shiva, he's the antithesis of everybody else in the same pantheon. Yeah, Shiva is living in the Kailasha and Shiva is uh, traveling with all kinds of boot pishats and all kinds of animals and he wraps a snake around his uh, wraps a snake around his neck and you know, so a lot of people hypothetically, I mean, they have a hypothesis that Shiva is Shiva was actually a Dravidian god. And because he was so powerful in his, uh, Shiva was so powerful in his popularity, even back then, that uh, the, the so-called sanctimonious Aryans could not ignore him. So they were like, let us co-opt him. Let us make him one part of the Trinity. You know, that is what is say, being said here also with Christian, tra Christian traditions in the process. Some scholars argue that many of the customs and symbols associated with modern day Christian holidays such as Christmas and Easter have their origins in pre-Christian pagan festivals. So here also, if you look carefully, what are you doing? You are organizing your celebration around a tree, the Christmas tree, you know. In the 19th and 20th centuries, there was a resurgence of interest in ancient pagan religions and practices. People started taking those things into account again. Scholars and spiritual seekers began to explore and reconstruct these ancient belief systems, seeking to revive the old ways and establish new pagan traditions. So, you know, the beginning of the passage did talk about, uh, one second, did talk about neo-paganism, right? So the neo-paganism came in, in uh, 20th, 19th, 20th century. So this new pagan, neo-pagan movement, I'm at the last line, incorporates elements of folklore. Folklore in Hindi is known as Lok Katha or the tales or the legends that have been perpetuated and uh, passed down from generation to generation. Uh, folklore, mythology, and nature worship, emphasizing a deep connection with the natural world and the reverence for the cycles of life. Yeah, this is very interesting, you know, I mean, across the world, pagan worshipping was um, kind of persecuted. And you will notice that in India also, we had pagan worshipping. When you look at the concept of Vayu Devata and Pavan Devata and Agni Devata and Jala Devata, what are these? Essentially, they were the forces, the cosmic, celestial or natural forces that were being worshipped by the people so that they can avoid natural calamities, they can tap nature and be assisted by the nature. But later on, they were given, they were anthropomorphized. They were given the status of a devata, vriksha devata, like that. Malay devata, like mountains, right? Today, paganism encompasses a diverse range of beliefs and practices. Some pagans worship specific gods and goddesses from ancient pantheons, while others venerate, venerate is again worship, right? Venerate nature and the divine forces manifested within it. Many pagans emphasize personal spiritual experiences and direct connections with the divine, often practicing rituals and ceremonies in nature, like in the middle of a jungle, at the bottom of a hill, on the side of a, a riverbank, maybe. 
or in specially designated sacred spaces. Despite the association with witchcraft and magic in popular culture. So that's the problem. In popular culture, paganism is often associated with witchcraft. Because that is how it was popularized. That was the popular notion encouraged and perpetuated by organized religion that anybody who's not a Christian is a witch. You know, something like that. They practice witchcraft. So it is coming from there. Witchcraft and magic in popular culture. Not all pagans practice pagan pagans practice or believe in these aspects. Paganism is a fluid and individualistic spiritual path. When you say fluid, it means that it's not rigid. So basically the mantra of the 21st, 21st century, you do you. So it's a very liberal, fluid uh, kind of set of ideas that you can choose. I will believe in this, but I will not believe in that. You can do that. An individualistic spiritual path, allowing practitioners to adapt and shape their beliefs to fit their personal experiences and needs, right? Uh, the history of paganism unfolds as a rich and intricate narrative interwoven with ancient traditions, periods of persecution, stories of survival and the vibrant threads of a modern day revival. I think this is pretty much the main idea. The author himself has given the main idea to you. I'm going to read this for you. The history of paganism unfolds as a rich and na intricate narrative interwoven with ancient traditions, periods of persecution, stories of survival, and the vibrant threads of modern day revival. This is the summary, pretty much. As humanity continues to seek spiritual connections and meaning, the diverse and inclusive nature of paganism offers a rich and fulfilling path for many individuals around the world. That's true. When you look at paganism, it might not be that rigid. And I mean, we have seen how organized religion is creating a lot of problems in today's world, but you know, paganism could be a good alternative, socially speaking. Yeah. Another thing that comes to my mind, uh, the main idea you saw, the style of writing is pretty simple. Uh, the style is that of uh, description, describing the history, what happened, giving you facts, detailing. Uh, the author seems pretty erudite. He is coming from a point of knowledge, apparently. He's not just giving very conflicting, fantastical ideas. He has a basis for everything that he says, apparently. So these are the things. Um, one thing that I would like to tell you here is that it's very interesting to know that, see, today we are going through climate change and we are going through global warming and uh, sixth mass extinction event, like one million species are getting extinct every year from the face of the earth. Like small animals, even microorganisms taken into, in, taken into account. So maybe, just maybe we are looking at nature, mother nature, not the way we are supposed to. By looking at Mother Nature in a very exploitative, capitalistic way that, hmm, what else can I get from you? Uh, could have been if our worship was more based on nature, we could have probably taken care of nature in a better manner. Just a food for thought. I mean, just a thought that I have. Yeah. So that's that. I hope you read more about paganism and other forms of religion. You can start with the history of organized religion. You can start with uh, Abrahamic religions. You can start with Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam. That's one thing you can start with. Yeah. The connection between Judaism, <clears throat> Islam, and what? Uh, Christianity. Yeah. All right, guys, keep reading, keep learning, keep comprehending. I'm going to see you again in the next one. Hope you liked this discussion on paganism. Uh, take good care. Happy learning again.